You're listening to Talking Freely, where we discuss culture, politics, and religious freedom. Talking Freely is a podcast from Freedom for Faith, a Christian legal think tank that exists to protect and promote religious freedom in Australia. Welcome to Talking Freely. My name is Rowan McHugh. My guest today is Dr. Alastair Roberts, who works for the Theopolis and Davenant Institutes. He is an author of Echoes of Exodus, Tracing Themes of Redemption Through Scripture, and the forthcoming Heirs Together, A Theology of the Sexes. He participates in the Mere Fidelity and Theopolis podcasts and blogs at Alastair's Adversaria. Dr. Roberts, welcome to Talking Freely. Thank you very much for the invitation to join you. Before we look at some of your recent work, can you help us to understand what kind of work the Theopolis and Davenant Institutes do, as well as your role within them? Yes, um, they're very broad in- institutes in the work that they accomplish. So starting off with Theopolis, with whom I do the most work, Theopolis has, uh, its tagline is Bible theology and culture, but it is trying to integrate those things. So it's the connection between those things that is most clearly seen through their work. Um, Perhaps the best place to start is with the influence of James Jordan. James Jordan is a biblical theologian and Bible teacher whose work has been tremendously influential on a number of people. And yet his work is in many respects like um, an open secret among certain people you don't have the wider knowledge of his work that we'd really hope that people would have. And so, in part, the work of Theopolis is designed to publicise the sort of thing that James Jordan was doing. And at the heart of his work is a deep reading of scripture, which leads to a reinvigoration of the church's liturgy, and then a flowing out of the church's life into transformative um, discussion and practice of culture. And so Theopolis practices this in a number of different ways. First of all, we do a lot of Bible teaching. That's something that we really emphasize. Bible commentary, um, biblical reflection. Um, We have a weekly podcast where most of the time we're going through biblical texts. So we've recently done Jonah. We've gone through a number of themes of prophets, currently going through the book of Daniel. Um, done things on um, the tabernacle recently. Um, Peter Lightheart, our president, is currently working through the Sermon on the Mount. So these are absolutely central to what we do. And then we're trying to train people to serve the church. So alongside or within a typical seminary education, you won't get the sort of deep training in the intense typological and figural reading of scripture that we really want to see people practice and so we offer that alongside training in liturgy how to sing lead your church in singing how to um, practice a liturgy that brings people into a participatory appreciation of the worship of god and then we try and flow all this out into culture. So we reflect upon current cultural issues, be they moral questions about sexual ethics or things about politics, for instance. So we have a current Civitas group, which meets a few times a year where we're going through questions of post-liberalism, working with the work of people like um, Adrian Pabst and John Milbank. And so it's a very broad ranging institution, working from, on the one hand, and biblical exegesis, to political theology, to um, the practical work of liturgy. And it's one of the reasons I love working with the Theopolis Institute so much. The heart of their work, perhaps, is the, the flagship program we have, is the Fellows Program, where over a year we train um, young people in liturgy, in the reading of scripture, and in some of these cultural questions. And it really showcases, I think, the strengths of the institution. In the case of Davenant, Davenant, again, has a broad range of interests. First of all, the retrieval of Protestant wisdom. So we have a broad range of texts and insights and figures that 
they're part of our patrimony, but we've never really explored them as we ought to. And so one of the things that Davenant is trying to do is to rediscover some of the treasures that we have for the church and to reintroduce people to folk like Richard Hooker and others that they might never have explored in great depth, but are incredibly timely and relevant voices for the current time. And so Davenant seeks to do this in a number of different ways through publications, through courses, and through various other programs. We have um, a significant publishing venture. We have summer programs where young people generally will come together in a retreat center and we go through questions of Protestant wisdom, how to think about the world in a Christian way um, using Christian wisdom. And so we'll start off thinking about questions of knowledge of ourselves, knowledge of God, thinking about questions of anthropology, and then move into questions of timely relevance on um, politics, political theology, economics, um, questions of sexual ethics, questions of medical and um, an anthropology, these sorts of questions. And as a result, again, it's a very broad-based movement, a movement that brings together scholars from a number of different fields. And more recently, we've been expending a lot of our energy in the work of Davenant Hall, which generally teaches online. Um, one of the things that both of these organizations I work for have seen is the dearth of training in particular areas and for particular persons. And so what we're trying to do is to fill something of that gap, to have a far more accessible and affordable form of education um, for people who might not otherwise have had access to it and to have training in areas that you might not otherwise have been able to experience. So we bring together a large number of different students from different backgrounds and we're exploring questions of church history, questions of um, systematic theology, questions of biblical theology, which are most of the courses that I'll be teaching. And as a result, it's a very lively and stimulating environment to work in. I really enjoy the group of colleagues that I have that are constantly sharpening me and the students as well are absolutely brilliant. So it's been encouraging in the context, I think, of a more general economic or sort of institutional waning and um, collapse even to see these shoots of new growth and possibility rising up and to be part of that. I'd like to turn to a series of articles you've written on various cultural challenges in our time. The first examines the vexed issue of sexual identity. Quoting from your piece, one of the many problems with a culture of casual sex is the way it calluses people to protect them from the inherently dangerous promise of true and sustained personal exposure to the other sex. Promiscuous sexual behavior of those whose masculinity or femininity is bound up in desiring or being desired by the other sex as such, yet who have never been able to truly truly to expose themselves to any individual, their very promiscuity perhaps serving as a defense mechanism against such encounter. Can you elaborate on what you mean by this danger of sustained personal exposure? Yes. Um, when we think about relations with other people, there's a danger in the more that we open ourselves up to other people. And one of the things that I think that our society has encouraged us to develop are emotional and psychological prophylactics that protect us from the danger of being too open to other people, to be too emotionally invested, to be too exposed, to be not just physically exposed to them in a way that we might contract some STD or something like that, but also to be seen by them. And so whether it's by technique, whether it's by a sort of practiced indifference and detachment, or whether it's just through other sorts of callous, callousing or something that prevents us from being too exposed, we miss out, I think, on the promise of the encounter. One of the powerful things about marriage is that because there's a vow at the heart of it, 
the encounter is protected and there's a way in which, I mean, none of these things are perfect, but there's a way in which we are encouraged and freed to encounter the other in an exposed, naked way without fear um, of rejection or being exposed in the same way. And it's always dangerous to be exposed to other people, particularly people that we don't know very well, which is one of the reasons why casual sex raises some of the concerns that it does. When we think about that sort of relationship, you are exposing yourself to be judged by the other person. Um, am I good at this? is not just a question about the sexual encounter, but it's a question about you as a person. There's a sense in which your existence is invested in how the other person judges concerning you. Likewise, the desire of people can be very intrusive when it comes up close. We feel shocked when we're actually exposed to the personal character of the desire of the other, which can be almost a, an abyss that we don't we can't see to the bottom, we can't understand where it's coming from, and yet it's so close and proximate, and so it can be threatening. And that's something that, in the context of um, more anonymous or casual sexual rela relations, we're trying to avoid in various ways. We're trying to step back from the actual reality of what's happening. Whereas in the case of marriage, one of the intentions is to allow for the full potential and promise of that exposure to another person, to be seen by another person, to take place. And so the vow that is at the heart of marriage is something that facilitates that exposure to happen to its fullest degree. Quoting again, with the ascendance of spectacle and gender neutralizing technique, the elevation of gay and trans identities as sexualities of consumption and artifice is rendered possible and thinkable. It is imperative that we appreciate that such identities come with the broader cloth of a Western society of spectacle, technique and consumption as their condition of possibility. And with the transhumanist imperative to remake nature so as better to conform to desires that are, in a sense, that will become ever more apparent in the years to come, contrary to nature. This is a big question, but I'd love for you as a gift to the uninitiated to explain how the idea of nature can be meaningfully understood here, how it should be used to contend for public Christianity and how inelastic it is. Yes, and I think one of the things that maybe talk back from our cultural situation. In our cultural situation, we don't feel the force of nature very much. In some ways, this is accentuated by the conditions in which we're living, where much of our social and interaction, much of the context in which we're working out our identities and expressing ourselves is in the sort of microgravity of cyberspace. So within the context of the internet, there's less of a givenness to my identity. I'm representing myself. I'm not actually on the internet. What I have is projected representations of myself in various forms, various um, avatars or um, personas that I have adopted or other things like that. And that's how I'm identified. The gravity of my body is largely outside of that realm. And so the more that we spend time in that sort of context, the, the less we'll actually feel the gravity of our bodies and the world around us and the significance of the acts in which our bodies um, could be engaged. And nature in that sort of context can feel very distant. Um, I've compared this to the experience of a, someone going into space and in the microgravity of space, your, your body becomes disoriented in various ways. You may feel nauseous as a result of all the moving around and the fact that you're not oriented by gravity, your muscles will start to weaken because you don't have gravity pulling upon you and leading you to actually develop those muscles against the force of the Earth's gravity. You may find that your circadian rhythm is thrown out as you're experiencing a number of dawns in a single day. And in many of these other ways, you're experiencing a disjunction between your environment and your nature. Uh, as human beings, 
our bodies are designed to exist in the Earth's atmosphere and within its various environments. In space, all sorts of compensatory elaborate mechanisms have to be established, even for the most basic bodily functions to continue. And in many respects, our society is one in which the immediate context of the body can easily be forgotten. Now, the gravity of the body is something that can be not just something that's orienting and grounding. It can also be something that's profoundly onerous and its weight can be burdensome. So we feel the weight of the body in, in sickness. We feel it in pain. We feel it in mortality and in other things like this. And to the degree that we want to ameliorate or uh, mitigate those things, it's understandable that we should want to step back from something of the weight of the body. Yet the body, its weight doesn't go away. It can be easy to be forgotten in certain contexts, but its weight continues. In the context of such a society where our identities are increasingly explored in a context divorced from the weight of the world and the body and its interactions, it can be easy to put desire and um, a sort of detached sense of self into the driving seat, to have that as that which defines who we are and what our acts mean. And so my sexual acts, for instance, are not things that have a weight and meaning of themselves, rather they mean what I intend them to mean or don't mean. Uh, it can be an absolutely meaningless act if I want. Um, all that matters is what meaning I am going to project or impose onto that thing. And so in our society, I think it's very easy to forget the force of nature. And to forget does not mean that it has gone away. It continues in a great many ways. And often the challenge, I think, is, um, as a Christian, I find the challenge is just to make people aware of the fact that it hasn't gone away, to draw their attention to the ways that the gravity of nature is being felt upon them. Now, it's interesting um, the way that we can go through extensive conversations about things like sex in terms of being male or female, sex in terms of sexual relations and sexuality, gender, all these sorts of things with very little to no discussion of reproduction, for of procreation, the sense that there might be some end of this, that there might be something that gives it gravity or weight. Um, we can easily be forgetful of that. So why does it matter? Um, what's the difference between different sorts of sexual relations? Why have we given this one particular form of sexual relation such weight? Um, if you forget the gravity of procreation, it's very hard to understand. I mean, isn't every sort of sexual relation an expression, or at least in potential, an expression of love? Um, it could be seen that way. But yet, the fact that we've had one private relationship, a sexual relationship that is deemed to be worthy of society's sanction, recognition, and encouragement, and others more generally to be discouraged, is, is telling. It's something that gives weight to that particular thing. Oliver O'Donovan, uh, the Christian ethicist, has written about the way that it is that sense of the weight of that common, the weight of that sexual relationship, it's ordering out into the world that gives the weight to the relationship um, considered in itself. So the fact that this is something that has a potential beyond itself that it has a gravity within the world is one of the reasons why we take marriage so seriously. Were it not for that, it could be casualized. It could be treated as something, well, we maybe want to have the convenience of a bond together and maybe that will last for a few years. We can have a revisiting of the terms of this contract of marriage in about five years time, perhaps, and it's useful for tax purposes and other reasons like that. But it, at the heart of it, there's not really the weight. Um, but yet the weight is found when we rediscover its connection with nature, when we discover that the body of our activities and ourselves has a connection to an environment 
and uh, a realm which has a force of gravity that it exerts upon us and our activities. And so nature, I think, is something that all of us have some degree of apprehension of. All of us, to some extent, will feel its gravity. All of us are connected to this. We can't escape it. It's part of us. But yet, it's something that we can often talk about nature, for instance, in the context of what people talk about as natural law. And natural law can often be seen as if it's some sort of theory or philosophy that we've built around um, the concept of nature. That's probably an unhelpful way to think of natural law. A more helpful way would be to think of it as just something that's operative. Um, natural law is there whether we understand it or theorize it about, about it or not. Um, it's a sort of apprehension of my body. It's um, or one of the ways it's expressed is in my own apprehension of my body and its processes of growth. It's um, just in the same way as I might perceive my limbs to be related to my body. Um, we have an, a sense of our bodies within ourselves, of the weightiness of certain activities. And that sense is something that can be honed and developed. It can be something that is it's open to being weakened. There are times when I might lose sense of my body and its coordination. I might be disoriented if I'm spun around in a circle for a long period of time, I might feel dizzy. But yet that sense of our bodies is something that I think as Christians, we need to heighten and to develop what I think is best thought of as the art of living well, of recognizing the grain of our being and working with that grain. And so the concept of nature, I think, comes in in that sort of place, not as something that's just this abstract principle, but as a way of speaking about the reality of the created patterns that are operative within the world and the ways that we can lean into those, the ways that we can discover something of the, the given weightiness of reality in a world where it's so easy to push against that. Now, in speaking about the transhumanist impulse, that's in the same way as we can be detached from the natural weight of the world of nature and of our activities of our bodies, we can seek to push against that, to develop circumven circumventions of the natural, um, natural limits or to develop ways in which we can um, reverse them or whatever it is. And so one of the things that I've seen as a considerable danger in the idea of same-sex marriage, in the idea of um, transgender identities, etc., is the seed of transhumanism at the heart of those. So there seem to be a desire that legitimates the relationship that is seen to um, as a matter of justice, it has to be declared to be equal and interchangeable with the natural relationships that we have typically celebrated as a society. And as a result of that, what comes in is an insistence of medical, um, legal, um, technological means of circumventing the limits of nature. And so at the heart of something like same-sex marriage is a challenge to the significance of natural marriage, which is in part the fact that the relationship at the very heart of that has a fruitful potential and it has public consequences, at least in potential. And as we think about, for instance, the developments that that will encourage, it will encourage the detachment of children from their parents and an increased technologization of procreation. The idea, for instance, that we should be able to use reproductive technologies as means of circumventing the natural limits upon who can procreate, that you actually need to have a sexual relationship with someone of the other sex in order to procreate. Um, well, with donor gametes, with IVF, with um, increasingly sort of reproductive technologies, we'll be able to circumvent this. So maybe it will be a matter of what they're already exploring 
the possibility of engineering gametes from skin cells. And so you could have a child that biologically has two fathers because you've engineered uh, uh, an egg from a skin cell. Or you could think about the way in which people might um, want to avoid the awkwardness of surrogacy or adoption. And maybe we need to develop ectogenesis and have artificial wombs. Now, there's something about the very institution of same-sex marriage itself that has an impetus in that direction. And the more that we see the way that this has encouraged the increased dependence upon normalization of things like IVF as a typical way to have children, not just something that is an extreme measure to deal with the failure, but this is the this is the way in which you circumvent and avoid having to deal with nature at all. That's the sort of thing that I think we should see within this, what I've called transhumanist impulse at the heart of these things. And so the question of nature is a very live one in the debates about sexual ethics and um, the gender revolution. Many of these things have deep implications for our sense of who we are. What's the relationship between a child and their parents? What is, is, what is the reality of marriage? Is there something about marriage that is pre-political, pre-legal? The sense that there's a loving relationship that defines the child's existence, that the child has grown from a loving, committed bond between their two parents, and that they are enfolded within that bond, and there's something that needs to be protected about that. Well, of course, that can't be the case in the same way in any sort of same-sex relationship. Likewise, the idea that our bodies are primarily about appearance and the idea that our bodies might be ordered towards something beyond themselves and that you can't just change someone who's a man into a woman through sexual reassignment surgery. These are deep and very um, pressing questions within our context and nature is at the very heart of them not just the question of a very limited approach to nature, but um, the deep question of who are we as human beings? How do we see what it means to be human beings within the world? Is there anything that gives us weight outside of ourselves? Are our bodies and our actions merely expressions of our desires? Or is there something that gives grounding and um, some greater significance to what we are what we do and who we are and that's one of the concerns that i have in many of these debates that we focus too narrowly and not considered some of the broader issues that are at play and from the very beginning of some of these debates about same-sex marriage in our societies i've been trying to push people to pay attention to what is implied in these positions about the place of children and how we view children can children be viewed almost as if um, there's a production line and bodies are detached from persons and body parts are atomized. So you think about the gamete in a depersonalized sense. You think about the womb, of the surrogate, for instance, as something that can be commercialized. And you can think about it as a form of operation. You can, in some cases, say, okay, stop the production line. There's something wrong with this child. And these sorts of questions, I think, have always been matters of moral concern for Christians, in particular in the context of debates about abortion. But there's something about the aesthetics of um, certain forms of sexual relationships or uh, reproductive technologies that make it very difficult for us to perceive the humanity and the personhood of the unborn, for instance. One of the things that does make it possible for us to see the personhood of the unborn is the fact that, I mean, I think the most typical situation where the personhood of the unborn is really appreciated is in a loving relationship where people recognize that that child is not coming into the world as a stranger. That child is an expression of the deep, personal bond that exists between its two parents and it's not adopted as it were in some secondary um, sense as an object of love the 
child itself has grown out of the love uh, between their parents. And there's something pre-political, pre-legal to that. It's not something that's a technological medical project that's been undertaken by the parents, but it's something that is a natural expression of their one flesh union, as we might talk about in scripture. And so to rediscover those sorts of instincts, instincts that enable us to work with the grain of our nature, to see personhood where it really is, and as a result, to treat people in a truly personal way and with dignity, and then also to recognize the dangerous potential of dehumanizing transhumanist um, impulses and to see their subtle expression and um, working already in place in some of these legal and sexual innovations, I think is one of my, the concerns of my work. And in many respects, it's a lonely one. Um, not many people see these things. And many people, I think, are focusing more upon the immediate questions of religious liberty, um, freedom of expression, um, the sort of questions of um, recognizing people's desire and love and giving it some sort of social expression and sanction. Those questions, you can see where they're coming from, but I think it's important that we recognize some of the deeper implications of these innovations and speak to those. One final quote from the article, there is a difference between a house and a home. A house is an architectural edifice, often one of several constructed according to the same plan. A home is a house that has been rendered a personal habitation, a unique realm of life, communion and indwelling. In discussing matters of contemporary sexuality and gender, Christians have all too often been narrowly concerned to defend the edifice of Christian doctrine. However, they have provided people with scant imaginative and practical resources by which to make it their own home. You use this analogy to express current weaknesses in Christian formation. How is it that the church has found itself merely informing rather than helping people to inhabit the faith? And how does it relate to explaining the cultural conditions in our time? Yes. Um, exploring that analogy a bit more, I've been using that analogy in part to get at the disjunction in some of our public conversations between the more pastoral, as we tend to use that term, discourse about how you treat people who are working through some of these issues in a very personal way, and the more dogmatic theological concerns, which is about protecting an orthodox edifice of the faith. Now, those two things are compatible, but they're doing different things. And so if you want to have a good house, uh, a good home, you need uh, construction workers that are doing their job well, that design it in a way and build it in a way that is structurally, has structural integrity, that prevents it from um, collapsing or, or in any sense um, crumbling. But on the other hand, you're probably not going to get your interior decoration advice from the construction worker. When he's on the site, it's a bit of a mess. It's not something that's very habitable. But yet, his work is necessary for it to be habitable. And often, the way that we talk about these issues is, on the one hand, it can be neglectful of the construction of the architectural and the building work to actually have a, a, a building with structural integrity, some doctrine and some institution that is well designed and on the other hand we can either neglect that or we can neglect the task of giving people a means by which to inhabit um, these systems of truth and so how do we inhabit a system of truth often it's primarily i'd say through narrative the stories that we tell about ourselves now those stories are not just stories that we're passively telling the stories that are orienting and their scripts in some sense for our own existence. We can think of the way in which there's an implicit script of what it means to live a life and to go through what's expected in your society, the different landmarks of a person's life. So the way that they'll 
approach their education and you have to go through that particular stage and then you um, leave home and you go to university you get married you start a family and then all these different stages of you buy a house and as you go through that on the one hand you're just doing these things but behind all of those activities there's a larger sense of the narrative coherence that that gives to your life a sense of who you are a sense of how you fit into your society, a sense that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Now, that's one of the ways that we inhabit things. It's something that orients us quite powerfully. So you find the power of a narrative when you start to push against it. The idea, for instance, that maybe it's not the best idea for most people to go to university. Um, that is something that people will tend to push against because they feel this is something to aspire to within our narrative. Now, it can be helpful to tease out that narrative and think what's going on there. What are the particular considerations that have led to these values and these ways of narrating our lives? Um, what are the benefits of that? Now, generally, when you have a narrative within your society, um, those cultural narratives are really helpful for us. We don't have to think about all of these things for ourselves. We can take the accumulated wisdom of other generations of um, many other persons and integrate those into the formation of our own lives and live lives that are coherent and understandable to those around us. That is not a bad thing. But yet, as Christians in a society where we're ex increasingly at odds with the wider cultural values, it can be important to revisit some of our stories and to consider why we're telling the stories that we are. Um, are those stories actually good ones? And do we need alternative ones in their place or maybe adjustments to the existing ones um, there are many other forms that we can think of as stories and one of the things that Christian formation I think is designed to do is to help us to read the Bible not just as this is what happened back then maybe we can think of some interesting parallels with our own experience but this is our story we are the people of God who have been developed through the story, as Paul can talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, all our fathers passed through the cloud, and the sea, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And in that, he's telling the people in Corinth, most, mostly Gentiles, to look at the wilderness generation of the Israelites as their fathers, that this is part of their story. However, they might have told their story before that, how they might have thought about themselves in terms of maybe their Corinthian identity and the pagan associations that came with that. Now they've got a different story. They're part of a narrative that is explored through the Old Testament scriptures and can be discovered as we live into that. Now, that formation in a story is not just thinking about these nice parallels with our lives. It's thinking about a deep belonging and it's also thinking about the way that our bodies and other things fit into that. Now, one of the practices that is at the heart of the Christian faith is baptism, um, that we're baptized into Christ. And that is not just a way of expressing ourselves. It's something that connects us with the deeper story. And I've found it important to think about the way that we are addressed in our bodies through things like baptism and the way in which that helps us to tell our stories differently. So in baptism, my body is, as it were, marked out for resurrection. I might think of my body primarily as something that I'm using to do different activities in my daily life. I might not really think about my body until it actually starts to resist me in some sense, as I start to feel that cramp, as I start to, as I try to run in the way that I used to do, and I just find I'm not as fit as I, as I once was, or maybe I feel the effect of illness and, or the approach of, of death in human mortality, or maybe I feel something of the shame that can come with the body as you feel other people judging your body, or the shame that comes with the knowledge and the deep gut knowledge of what you have done with your body, or what other people have done to your body. These things are huge aspects of who we are that we don't generally speak to very well as Christians because we tend to think very much as an, on an ideological level, the Christian faith being about ideas, not something that really 
integrates our body into a wider story and reality. And so the idea of inhabiting um, Christian truth comes with an address to the body, an address to our imaginations, an address to our narrations of our lives, the big narratives and stories in terms of which we're living. Um, it comes with a recognition that Christ has addressed us in the realm of our body. He's declared that our limbs and organs are his limbs and organs, as 1 Corinthians chapters um, 5 and 6 talk about. Or we can think about the way in which our bodies are marked out for resurrection, as I said. Or our bodies are declared to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, not just our hearts as the realm of the Spirit's dwelling, but our very bodies. And our bodies can be experienced in different ways. If I'm acting, if I'm trying to um, acting in the world with my body, if I'm trying to run, for instance, I'm using my limbs and my body has a more functional purpose in that particular moment in time. In the context of a loving relationship, for instance, a romantic relationship, there's a different experience of the body. The caress of the wife, for instance, is something that is an address to the person in the realm of the body a personal address, where the body is not just seen as an instrument that you're using to express yourself, but a realm of personal address and recognition. And in the Christian faith, our bodies are also treated in that way. God wants to take up residence in our body by his Holy Spirit. He wants our bodies not just to be um, means for action, but to be set apart as precious and valuable. Whatever we have done with our bodies in the past, whatever has been done to them, however we feel mortality in our bodies, whatever other people see when they look at our bodies, however we may feel our bodies to be broken or uh, whatever it is, um, our bodies have been marked out for a destiny in the future. And when we look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning, it's important to remember that. And our bodies and our identities can be profoundly formed by just these regular practices, like looking at ourselves in the mirror in the morning. Um, ourselves can be formed through the practice of looking at ourselves in the mirror of social media, which is a new sort of mirror, a mirror in which we're projecting ourselves and constantly being judged and perceiving ourselves within a group spectacle and the ways that our identities are rendered within that context. And so, the challenge, I think, as Christians is to form ourselves not just through ideas, but through deep embodied practices, through the imagination, through stories that give us dramatic templates within which to live our lives. And so that's really what I'm trying to get at in that statement, to push us towards this more comprehensive formation that moves people beyond knowing, okay, we hold that this form of sex, these forms of sexual actions are not appropriate for Christians to engage in, uh, which can often be a very negative approach that is the approach that we lead with, to helping people to think about why that is the case. Because the body has been given such value at the heart of the Christian faith, it is not just seen as a means for express, personal expression and experiencing a pleasure, it's seen as a realm of profound personal encounter. It's seen as something that's set apart as holy and precious. And ideally what we're trying to do is giving people the orienting stories, um, imaginations, ways of seeing and perceiving themselves and ways of acting in the world that will help them to experience all of that on a gut level and no longer just to feel this external force of a law outside of themselves, but to feel within themselves the goodness of that, that it corresponds with something that is true and right, that they apprehend on a very gut level. You released an article last year entitled The Christian Art of Dying Well. Since that time, several states in Australia have legalized euthanasia or have introduced bills to do so. You write how modernity has buffered death from our normal frame of reference, denying the gravity of the grave and the weightiness of life. Can you take us through the theological and cultural ways that the West arrived here and why it's created such challenging conditions for the plausibility of Christianity? Yes. 
one of the things Ephraim Radner describes in his book, The Time to Keep, is the great transition, this movement in Western society and increasingly in society more generally across the world from an age where death had a very immediate presence and people thought of themselves in a way that integrated death into their understanding of their self to one in which through medical innovations, through things like better sanitation in hospitals and elsewhere, through things like um, more advanced medical procedures, antibiotics, vaccinations, and all these different things, we've been able to stave off a lot of the mortality that we would otherwise have experienced. We've extended our lives and extended the period of our lives in which we can be enjoying health. So many people in the past, when they would have extended their lives, they would nonetheless have experienced a great lack of health in their later years to a degree that is strange to us where many people can enjoy good health into their 70s and 80s and active lives where formerly they would have felt very much the effects of their mortality. Um, that is a great innovation. Likewise, the ways that we've got institutions that shield us from the reality of death. So death, as it happens in our society, increasingly happens in sterile rooms behind closed doors. It's not something that happens at the heart of family life, nor do we, I mean, we live in an incredibly graying society um, in the West. We think about the birth rates and how they've fallen, but yet it's amazing how invisible age is within our society. Everyone aspires to be young, that's one aspect of it, but also the aged are increasingly invisible to us. And so we're wary of that. We don't really re want to look at death to come up close and to see what it is. Um, it's something that we don't talk about that much. The book of Ecclesiastes, a, a lot of the the book of Ecclesiastes is about the issue of death and the importance of wisdom in the face of death, a wisdom that meditates upon death, upon the temporality and trans transitory character of life, the way in which life is like the operative metaphor throughout the book of vapor. It's something that is difficult to get hold of. It's inscrutable. It's not something that you can really control. It's something that doesn't last. It doesn't leave a mark behind it. It's something that you must grope through. And in many ways, our lives are like that. We, however, don't experience on a deep gut level our mortality in a society where it's constantly hidden from us. And we've got these mechanisms that are designed to save us from being exposed to death in a troubling way. So we can go through, many people can go through decades of their life having very little exposure to death. Um, seeing a dead body, um, experiencing the death of a loved one even, um, the weakening of the bonds between the generations has made it increasingly possible for people to have little exposure to older people. And as a result, they just don't see the deaths of those of older generations. And so our own mortality can come up behind us as a sort of shock something that we become aware of later on, but haven't really been living with and reflecting upon throughout our lives to that point. So that transition, I think, is a crucial part of it. It's enabled us to think about our lives primarily within the, the space of their own span. So I understand the meaning of my life in terms of my individual self-realization. In an age where you feel mortality a lot more, you would think of your life a lot more in terms of the sacrifices of former generations and the sense of the debt that you owe to that, the sense of the sacrifices that you would make for generations to come, the way in which your life belonged to a larger story, the way in which you were prepared to lay down your life for your country, for your family. Um, and that's seen for men primarily in the context of war, perhaps, and for women in the context of childbirth, the um, sense of being invested in a generation and in lives that are not your own. And that is something that very 
basic experience of human existence has shifted for us as a result of some of these innovations and advances, which are nonetheless wonderful things that we should be deeply thankful for. The question is, how do we retain a healthy and wise human understanding of death and mortality? Because it's very hard to understand our own end if we're not thinking about our terminus. Um, it's one of the things that I think in the Christian understanding of the fall, we're probably, we don't think enough about the grace that God shows in bringing death into the world as a sort of buffer. Um, were it not for death, we would be able to develop in the paths of sin more fully. And so death is a sort of pruning of sin and its developments. It's also something that forces us to reflect upon our end. Um, death is the end in the sense of cutting us off, ending our lives. But it's also the, in that way, it's also something that causes us to reflect upon our, the telos of our lives, the end in that sense. What are our lives about? What's their purpose? What is the meaning of it all? And death, mourning, the context of um, the end of someone's life, causes us, pro provokes us to actually look back and think, what was their life about? What made this a good life? Or what made it a life that fell short in some respect? And death brings us to that deep um, wrestling with the meaning of existence. And it's one of the reasons why the book of Ecclesiastes, all the fraughtness of that question of the meaning of life is provoked by this knowledge of mortality of transitory human existence of temporality of this fleeting character of our lives and so the more that we establish life and its its terms its um its avoid its avoidance of mortality its um shielding from the reality of mortality etc as the terms in which we understand everything the more that things like euthanasia will become plausible to us. The idea that our deaths might be a necessary and important and valuable reality at the heart of our human society, that we might actually give our deaths to others uh, in the sense of die, learning to die well in a way that gives uh, or we, that we die in recognition of the meaning of a life lived, even when that death can be painful and ugly and gruesome in many respects as the body decays and um, it's not always easy to die with dignity. Um, but yet there's something deep about our humanity that's revealed in the process. And I think the more that our society has shrunk away from and flinched at the sight of death, the less apt it has been for understanding the meaning of our lives. The weightiness of life is nowhere more powerfully experienced than in the face of death. Um, we talk about matters of life and death, but <laughs> the matters of life, what are the matters of life? The matters of life are seen most clearly when people approach their death. What are someone's last words? What are their dying wishes? What are the things that they wish they had done? What are the things that become meaningful to them in the face of their death? Those are the matters of life. And yet the matters of life in terms of our daily activities can be things that are profoundly divorced from those things that are the real matters of life. We can go about our lives thinking as if the next um, raise that we're hoping for or if the next house move, whatever it is, that these are the things that really give our lives meaning. But in the face of death, maybe we get a different aspect of life. We perceive something more meaningful and true about who we are. Now, that relationship to death, that relationship to life is deeply intertwined. And for instance, the more that we tolerate things like euthanasia, the more that we move towards a devaluing of life that is precarious, life that is painful, life that is um, limited in some sense. And so in the same way as with 
abortion, there was a recent controversy about Richard Dawkins' statements about Down's children. And again, there's something about abortion that is dehumanizing for human life. The life and the vigor and the humanity and the, um, the deep lessons that we can learn from um, people with Down syndrome in our midst are forgotten when we think about life in the terms that someone like Dawkins would encourage us to. And so I think in the same way with euthanasia, that there is the increased perception of the life of the elderly, of those who are suffering with persistent pain, things like that, their lives is disposable, their lives is lacking meaning. Their lives also as sufferers, as being things that ideally we want to remove from us. The thing about death and suffering is it's deeply painful to look at. We don't want to see this, it's discomforting, it reminds us of our own mortality. It is also something that makes us feel powerless. Um, we can't actually change the situation of this person, we can palliate their suffering to an extent, but we feel the limits of our human providence and control. And in that context, I think we can easily mistake the, um, the suffering of someone or the um, injustice that they suffer as the, what we're trying to do is relieve our own discomfort about those things, to remove that from us. We can think that injustice is best removed by removing the victim of it. Um, that suffering is best overcome by removing those who experience it. But yet life is meaningful, even in the face of suffering. And there's a deep humanity that is recognized in the face of even the most undignified conditions that come in our death. And the way that we face up to death, I think, is a context in which we can discover our own humanity, our own solidarity with others. And the more that we tolerate and encourage the devaluing of life in its precarious and painful conditions, the more that we will also devalue and threaten the lives of the most, of the weakest and most vulnerable among us. And so I think as Christians, there's always been this concern to recognize the value and the meaning of the life of those who others would not value. And to recognize not just that there is something um, marginally valuable about them, but that some of the deepest lessons about our humanity is learned in the presence of such people, by slowing down and being around them, by experiencing their mortality, by allowing them to give us their deaths. Um, we can think about the way that people have described the Christian faith as training in the art of dying well. And that's something that can be easy to forget in a society that does everything that it can to escape the reality of death and the face of, the threatening face of something that might put a limit, limit upon the levity of our lives. And that gravity, however, is something in terms of which the weightiness of our life can be more powerfully experienced. If you want to know the weight of life, and the, what the matters of life really are, the things that give life meaning, you do have to tarry in the face of death to recognize the value of those whose lives are approaching death and the fact that their life, even in that most, when they're just hanging on in those last moments, their life has meaning and that we are going to be present with them in that moment, I think is one of the ways in which we recognize that for ourselves, but also more generally as a society, we give dignity to and recognition to those who otherwise can so easily be abandoned. And in societies where euthanasia and abortion have been completely normalized, what I think we see very clearly is the cheapening of life and the cutting off of the marginal and those who would otherwise be um, a burden upon society. That language is just very ugly language. I don't want to be a burden. But yet, as Christians, the burdens of others um, are not devalued. 
the burdens of others are things that we bear with them. And in bearing those, we discover something about who Christ is and who we are in that very deeper sense. Our Savior was revealed in the context, most clearly in the context of his weakness and death. And our presence in those moments of death is one of the ways in which we walk in his steps. You wrote an article last year on the current racial tensions being experienced in America, which have unfortunately, in many instances, spilled over into the church. Uh, quoting from the article, a narrative of guilt and victimhood, which the racial narrative has often been, can also have the unpleasant effect of leaving the guilty abject and the victims dependent and stripped of agency. And this has rendered the racial discourse and various other discourses of victimhood that followed in its wake a powerful means of consolidating control and power in the hands of governments, corporations, and various other larger institutions in society. The fact that civil rights discourse is so celebrated and co-opted by America's oligarchic class should be a source of caution. Can you describe how this co-opting by the oligarchic class happens and the impact it has upon the African-American community? Yes, I, th I think one of the clearest ways to see it is the, maybe you could talk about as the HRification of so much of the racial discourse. If you uh, think about uh, D'Angelo um, and other figures like that who are writing in this area, um, racial discourse has ended up being a means to control workforces and the readiness with it with which it is co-opted and fitted into the structure of the corporation, I think should give us pause. And we should recognize in that there's something, there's something troubling that the whole reality of racism has often been most clearly expressed in the corporate and government control of larger groups of people. And the fact that it, the form of, anti-racist discourse that we're currently experiencing can so easily be co-opted by those same forces maybe should give us some pause. Um, I think one of the reasons it's so powerful is because it presents those institutions as the, the brokers of a just new society. And so it presents the natural relationships between human beings as profoundly dysfunctional and um, it, it's not something that the societies themselves and persons in their daily interactions can really resolve. You need special, you need experts, you need training, you need um, institutional measures in a way that tends to, uh, it tends to pathologize people who are dealing with these without the right terms. It's the expert class with their particular um, terminology with their structures, with their systems and programs, they are the solution. And yet um, the actual relationships between people on the ground can often be made even more fraught by these. People can be encouraged precisely by those agencies to see themselves as dependent upon the agency. The agencies are the brokers of the just new society. And so people are supposed to look to those agencies to act on their behalf. But yet, I think this is to betray many aspects of, I mean, this is not to be identified with anti-racist discourse entire. There are whole traditions of anti-racist discourse that have been far more focused upon developing the agency of particular communities, their understanding of themselves and the dignity of their being able to act in the world that would try and deny them that agency. And in all sorts of ways, in their systems and structures, in their institutions, in just their daily personal interactions to prevent them from being um, forces within their society. Now, that dependence upon institutions, the abjectness, the need to develop these um, brokering parties for society and its structures, that I think is, I would see that as partly a betrayal of the potential of these, these movements. 
the danger is that these particular approaches, these forms of anti-racism that have been very much co-opted by HR and these other structures, HR is not primarily about um, the needs of individuals and workforces, it's about the needs of the company. Um, it's a very different thing from a union, for instance, in principle. It's there in large part to protect the company from legal action, it's to make the workforce more effective, things like that, to prevent certain dysfunctions within the organization. But it's not the same thing as the sort of agency that I think traditionally in many forms of um, anti-racist movements, communities have wanted to develop for themselves. The concept of victimhood, I think, is a very powerful part of this. René Girard, who's written about victim um, victims perhaps more, almost more than anyone else in his discussion of the scapegoat mechanism, has talked about the danger of a, what he calls a victimology developing, a system in which victimhood becomes detached as this universal value that to be a victim um, in any sense at all um, is wrong and um, that we elevate victims. And so victimhood is almost pursued. But yet there are problems with that sort of approach because it renders people increasingly passive, dependent, abject. And yet that I think is to miss, for instance, we could take the illustration of the injustice of someone who is run over by a, a driver um, who's driving under the influence and there is deep blame that is appropriate for that. He is a victim of the driver, but yet how is he going to recover? Is it going to be primarily by leaning into that victimhood, by focusing upon the blame upon the person who first inflicted that injury? Or will it be through developing agency of his own, rediscovering the agency, learning to um, walk again for himself and um, developing the strength that has been denied him. Now, in our society, I think we do need to think, in our societies, I think we do need to think very seriously and address issues of blame. Um, I think we need to think about issues of reparations and other things like that. But alongside that, it is absolutely essential to maintain that strand of anti-racist discourse that has always been about developing agency in the face of injustice and in the face of deep wrong and not just reducing yourself to a victim and pursuing justice by appealing to organizations, to brokers who present themselves as often the same people who would formerly be seen as oppressors are now presenting themselves as the great benefactors, patrons, and brokers of the new society. And that I think should give us, should be troubling to us because there's a lot of power in assuming that particular role. And as those who are critical of that, I think we also need to be aware of recognizing the degree to which the actually existing anti-racist movement has often has increasingly become wedded to that sort of approach and not to dismiss it um, carelessly for that reason. Um, the danger is <laughs> that a lot of criticism of anti-racism is about just extinguishing an anti-racist movement, not enhancing it. And so there's not anything better being offered. There's not an alternative being encouraged rather it's just closing down um, what is actually being practiced out there i would like to see our societies with a more effective form of anti-racism that moves away from some of the dysfunctions of the current movement that i see but that does require something um, rather than nothing so you can't beat something with nothing and what we currently have are many attempts to do just that to close down the actually existing anti-racist movement with all of its dysfunctions um, without really an alternative. And so I think that is something that we really need to work towards to rediscover and 
highlight some of the strands of of anti-racism that are not leaning into victimhood in the same way, that are not empowering these central agencies to the same degree. Um, I don't think that's good for anyone. Um, and to form forms of anti-racism that really empower people themselves, um, that's really what I would like to see. But I think it's a very difficult conversation to have in part I mean, I'm speaking about this from the context of the UK, which is very different from the US. We have different sorts of racial tensions and problems over here. And so I am aware that it's limiting in the degree that, to which I can or should speak into that situation. But those are some of my concerns. Dr. Roberts, thank you very much indeed for joining me today on Talking Freely. Thank you very much for having me. That's it for our latest episode of Talking Freely. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can do so through our website, www.freedomforfaith.org.au. Freedom for Faith exists through the generous donations of individuals and organisations across Australia. If you'd like to financially partner with us, you can do so through our website.